Hello and welcome to another episode of Through an Opaque Lens with me, Niall Murphy, and excuse the great indoors. But today is a different format. I'm actually uh, doing an interview. This is something that's going to become a recurring collaboration. Probably uh, we'll see how it goes, but it looks like it's going to become a recurring collaboration. Um, today I'm chatting with uh, Ant. You remember Ant? Ant Insuli, who I met um, last time I visited England, who you may remember from uh, Discerning Consciousness. Um, He's just going to appear in audio form, so uh, I'm just going to have to put his avatar on one side, I think. So yes, um, so yeah, welcome back, Ants, to uh, to the. Oh, thank show. you, Niall. It's 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 good. It's really good to see you. How how is life treating you in the in the Philippines? Oh yes, yeah, uh, been nice since I got here. It started out a little bit chaotic. The the move from Costa Rica to the Philippines was a bit much, uh, you know, because it's something I you can. Yeah. It's like going from England to New Zealand, pretty much. It's that sort of distance. So um, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, but uh, but then you know when we got back, we managed to get settled within the first two or three weeks, and uh, all the chaos died down. So yeah, it's so uh, nice. And um, God, this uh, this house is uh, twice the size for half the price compared to what I was living in when I was last in Devon. So right. Can't knock that. And uh, but it's a bit hot though. That's the thing. It's always hot here. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Super so, um, spiring there. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed, I'm sure I wasn't alone in those who follow your YouTube channel, called yeah. Through an Opaque Lens, enjoying your um, your travel video or your vlog. That was, yeah, that was a, a, a interesting, yeah, new new little venture there. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, I can't really do them all the time, but, you know, I've not done anything like that no. before. <laughs> but this this camera i got at the moment, the, uh, the little Osmo Pocket 3, is uh, really handy because before I was using a huge Canon camera on a giant gimbal, so it wasn't it wasn't easy to uh, to do stuff like that. So um, so I got to ask, yeah, what's uh been? How's your last year been for you then? Um, yeah, not not too bad actually. I've ma I've been managing to um find solace away from the screen, yeah. which is very good. Um. In terms of my particular content, as you know, Discerning Consciousness podcast was yeah. deleted by the good folk at um, YouTube back oh, yeah. in September 2022. So since then, I've been really focusing on my audio podcast on Podomatic. And since last June, I, I started um, just an audio weekly diary called Into the Void. Um, just basically what's kind of like been on my mind during the previous week. So, yeah, I've been doing that. I've been, um, yeah, I wanted to make things a little bit more free flowing. Uh, we were talking yeah. about that before we came on recording because mm. um, typically uh, with my discerning consciousness uh, output, it can become a bit like um, sort of audio form of essays because I'm, I'm kind of, um, I think my first love really is writing and all the rest of it. But I'm a bit lazy to like set up a Substack account and actually formally write because I know how <laughs> much effort yeah. it takes so for years i think my audio podcasts have become sort of like um yeah audio versions of essays if you like mm. and i think part of what i want to do is actually get some focus together and do some more formal writing so yeah that's what i've been up to really in terms of content and stuff like that yeah, yeah that's cool no because i mean i used to be on there podomatic uh, before but then uh, i don't know why i didn't even do youtube before i suppose i should have done really but um you know. yeah but uh yeah i just uh as i said to you before i thought that was really out of order and throwing you off there they should have thrown <laughs> they should throw me oh god so i'm on youtube saying that now hey? or better not yeah. attempt fate but uh i don't know i just thought yeah. that your i thought your content was actually quite temperate i thought your your temperament was very mild and you know i'm more irreverent and sarcastic i thought <laughs> why why would they uh why would they come after you it just didn't seem to make any sense to me i don't it? know yeah, with 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 an audience mm. of sort of like one man and his dog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's just like I'm this huge great threat. I don't know. I don't know. Um maybe there was a bigger story to it, I don't know. In yeah. terms of my own journey perhaps. Yeah. No, but it's very strange. Anyway, so Mr. Mm. Opaque Lens, mm. what what's what's going on in the world with this um this insanity and this mass polarization and and it's just insane information streams cutting coming at us and all this black pill stuff and uh yeah. yeah it's kind of crazy oh it is it's it's completely crazy i mean 
I've uh, I've decided I'm, I don't um, I, I I sort of got this thing now where um, I have to verify because I don't trust anymore, you know. Yeah. And, and I have this thing where I don't I don't believe anymore, so I just suppose if that makes sense. Right. But um, there was a couple of things we were talking about, you know, before we started this, and um, I mean, we were talking about the whole Kate Middleton thing, right? and um, we're talking about the truthers. And yeah, you rightly brought up that a lot of them. I don't, I don't want to mention any names here because you know some some of them I know, and I don't know. I'm upset. It's up to them what direction they want to go in. But a few of them have uh, gone down the God Brother route and become Christians, and I do find it really weird how. A bunch of uh, we call it a bunch of the truth movement have all suddenly become Christians. It seems really, really strange to me because, uh, well, you know, I know that on one hand I look at it and I think that we've got this the uh, people who seem to be in a god-shaped hole, like the the the, the social justice warriors, the woke, the blue haired lot. They all look like they're in a um, like a, a world that's completely godless. And then at the same time, they're juxtaposed against a new religion. Well, as I say, a 1,400-year-old religion. I don't really want to name, but everyone knows which one it is. That seems to be very threatening and very intimidating. And I think what's happened is that because people who um, don't want to fit into that one, the one beginning with I, if you like, don't want to, <laughs> um, yeah, don't, can't fit into the whole woke thing either, what happens is this has created um, a need, I suppose, for the, a new orthodoxy to happen. And I, my theory is that the, it's pushed the whole truth movement towards the right politically and towards Christianity. And if anyone had told us back in the 1990s that the counterculture would, would become like the Christian right, we'd think to ourselves, what? You tell me that all the people who used to be weird, that 20th century weirdos are all going to become more like the Westboro Baptist Church. It just seems ridiculous to me now seeing all of that. But that that seems to be what has happened. I, I don't know. I just find it very strange that people yeah. don't, they define themselves by their adversaries and fill, mm. fill a void, um, you know, that otherwise wouldn't be filled. And there seems to be something collective in that rather than individual, if you, if you get what I mean. But I'll be interested in your take on it, though. Yeah, there is, um, yeah. there's quite a lot of um, content creators on YouTube who are, yeah. I would say, part of this whole Christian revival, in inverted commas. And I think yeah. there is a part of that that... Um, I mean, can you, you 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 rightly point out, um, you know, the influence of Islam within British society and other parts of the world. Mm. But again, there's certain types of people who then take that too far, I think, yeah. and then they fill it all with paranoia. So they they'll share on their content, and they, a viewer would give the impression that every Muslim that comes into this country, however it is, legally yeah. or not, is being armed at the border. Mm. Uh, and, you know, when the economy goes tits up, they're all going to start shooting the indigenous population. Literally, they're putting that out. Now, yeah. don't get me wrong, I, I think it would be naive um, not to admit that there is an issue with Islam and Sharia law in the UK. We know that. But again, it's like, let's, let's, let's you know, let's not then go off and into these extremes yeah. that there's all these youngsters. They said there's all these young Muslims being armed and they're just ra waiting, uh, yeah. you know, to kill all the Kufa. Or, I, I'm, I'm not saying there isn't an issue yeah. with young Islamic men coming into the country, but it is this sort of Christian revival whereby it, then it gets imbued with what I see as um, mm -hmm. an extreme perspective. I could be wrong. Yeah. You know, maybe I'm going to be shot when it or when everything goes tits up as an indigenous whitey. <laughs> yeah. <know. laughs> well, also, the other thing that I've noticed is because I, when I changed planes um, on the way back here, one of the places I went to change planes was Qatar. And um, yeah. I was in Doha airport, really nice airport, actually. And I didn't feel there was any problem there. I didn't feel, you know, like, um, again, what's really strange about it is that um, most people there were either from the Philippines or India. Most of the people working there. And um, there's a lot of Westerners there. And um, I, I, I noticed that, like, if you go there or Abu Dhabi or Dubai, um, what you find is that, like, you could have a conversation with, like, a lot of the, the Muslims there, the sheikhs with the, you know, the towels with the rim around their heads. And you could talk oh, to yeah. them. Yeah. And um, they'll tell you that they don't let any of the nutters in. They don't let any of the really, really extreme loonies in, you know. 
And um, I have actually had a conversation about this with a Muslim on, on Twitter once, you know, and um, the conclusion that, you know, he came to the same conclusion that, you know, it needs to have some sort of reformation. Maybe one day in the future, some sort of peaceful imam would be able to declare a fatwa against the, you know, the violent verses, if you like. But the problem that the UK has is because it's gone so woke, and not, like, not just the UK, but Europe in general, because it's gone so woke and there's so much fear of being racist, it's scared to actually have this conversation in case, um, you know, in case any of the people who have this conversation get cancelled or, or they're told they're part of the loony far right or whatever. And um, the problem that we uh, have there is that, like, um, you know, the, the actual people in the Arab world and the oil rich states, like, uh, like say, UAE and uh, Qatar, um, they don't have this issue at all. They know that you know if they if they were to just bring in any old Tom, Dick, and Harry from the from their neighbouring parts of the Arab world, their country would become a failed state and would become a basket case. So they have a very strict idea of what it should be like, and um, they know that they want there to be pr economic prosperity for everyone. So it's very much a, an area of laissez-faire capitalism, free markets, and stuff like this. And um, mm. good infrastructure all built up and everything. And um, like they have rules of what you can and you can't do. But, you know, there are places where Westerners can drink alcohol. But they, you know, as long as there's a certain line that you don't cross, as long as you know what the protocols are, you're probably going to be all right in a place like that. But, um, mm. but the West, unfortunately, it's just uh, it's just getting the dregs. I mean, the best way I can describe it is imagine that, like, um, I don't know, I don't want to use the wrong language, but I, I can I can say this because I've first cousins who are like uh, uh, itinerant feral gypsies who I'm glad they don't know where I am <laughs> these days, right? And um, imagine that like uh, England decided it was going to become proper and posh, and um, the only the only white people we we're going to allow in were all going to be well-to-do middle class or posh people, and we decided that we're not going to allow all the do as you likeies from the rest of the of the white world to come in. Right. Um, that's the same thing, I think, as what's going on in the UAE and in Qatar. They, um, you know, mm. and also when I went to Morocco, I liked it there. People were very nice. Um, I had no issue with anything. There's certain countries I wouldn't want to go to, you know, within that, that realm, which have uh, different strains or different belief systems in there could be a problem. But, um, but the trouble is that, like, all the real zealots are all seem to be invading Europe. And it's more a problem with zealotry, I think, than it is to do with a religion in, uh, you know, uh, specifically. And um, at the same time, the, the Wokies are turning out to be the ultimate useful idiots, not realising that once um, there is an end game, like I say, they might, they might not all want to kill us, but over a couple <laughs> of generations, right, over a couple of generations, once um, the, the, how could I say, the economic or was it religious or cultural landscape eventually changes what it will do the uh the people are what i think of as the godless woke are only going to go in one direction or the other one lot are going to become conservative christians and right wing and the rest of them will probably be you know initiated into islam and then we're probably going to have a holy war and um the, the by that point a lot of the muslims will not be foreign they will be indigenous i think and mm. um, there'll be some kind of holy civil war, I think, that will go on. If you know, it looks like that's a possible future um, for mm. the UK. And um, the the people in the UAE and in in Qatar will probably look at the, what's going on in Europe, or well, the, I'll be calling it Eurabia by that point, and they'll be thinking, "Oh, we're not, <laughs> we're still not letting those nutters in." So you know. So, but 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 the wokies who uh, who carry on doing what they're doing with their 70 genders and their uh, you know <laughs> the rainbow flags and all the rest of it well the thing is that like uh, if they don't convert to islam uh, or if they don't convert to uh, sort of like uh, christianity or whatever they'll be seen as the most irreligious of infidels and um, the, the future will be right you lot you've outlived your usefulness for our agenda with you're the first people we're going to put up against the wall and shoot and um, that that happens. That has happened in um, in the past when uh, you know dictatorships or authoritarian regimes have taken over countries. They start with the useful idiots, and then when the useful idiots yeah. are done, 
they're then like done away with and they think right you've done what we needed to do you create the chaos now we don't need chaos mm. anymore we don't need, need you anymore and that's not me coming from our conspiracy narrative that's coming from our the playbook historical of how, yeah the historical playbook so yeah. yeah it's sort of speaking to the the uh archipelago Arch- archipelago I can't remember. gulag, gulag. Archipelago. yeah yeah. yeah oops sorry um yeah it's interesting points that you make um nuanced points about yeah. um about uh, Islam and countries in the Middle East. Uh, I yeah. just want to pick up, um, in terms of woke, what I've found interesting yeah. since last October, the events that have happened, uh, Israel, Gaza, yeah. the whole uh, inherent contradictions of woke have been exposed because, yeah. of course, the political establishment, on the one hand, has to try and keep all uh, British Muslims, I'll use that phrase, British Muslims, on board, whilst at the same time, Obviously, they can't come out and um, openly criticise Israel's actions. So you've got this juxtaposition, yeah. and it's you know it's 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 really interesting because and and also what that speaks to I think is that how going forward a lot of these agendas are going to I believe unravel in terms of woke because they are just so inherently contradictory, and you can't keep everyone in under the church. You can't keep everyone singing from the same hymn sheet and it, it's you, and you've seen it certainly within the Labour Party you've got um, you know candidates councillors um, Muslim councillors um, resigning and and undou- undoubtedly at the un- upcoming election sorry it's going to impact um, it's going to impact the the, la- the Labour vote so mm. in terms of yeah I agree in terms of um, it does appear as if we have the dregs <laughs> <laughs> the dregs coming in and and when sort of western well british kind of mainstream media outlets when they talk about islamic countries it's so unnuanced whereas you're talking towards nuance of these places like mm. they talk about iran as if it's you know full of um hicks um full of or they're all full of extremists whereas we've all seen footage from tehran and parts of it look like hollywood boulevard uh, or and <laughs> You know, yeah. if we if we spent time in um, Iran and these other countries you were talking about, we go, oh my God, it's actually better here. The infrastructure isn't falling apart, yeah. and we don't have to deal with all these all this sort of um, mediocrity in terms of bureaucracy and all these crazy ideas that yeah. we know um, are basically morally bankrupt, but somehow we have to still go along with it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's true, and um, you know, I'm I'm looking at this whole situation now. I mean, it's weird for me because I'm looking at it from afar, and I've only got the internet, so I'm probably going to get an exaggerated version of everything, now, <laughs> which is a shame. But you know, last time I was in England, because it was yeah, it was about this time last year, I went back there briefly. It was, and um, I kind of felt that uh, I mean, it was nice where I was living in that corner of Devon. It weren't too bad, but whenever I went to um, the, the outskirts of London to see my mate up there. Um, I, I've noticed it changed really a lot, you know, and um, I kind of felt that uh, I wasn't comfortable with that change when my mate was a bit more comfortable than me, but I think he's a little bit more left-leaning than I am in a lot of ways. Uh, but I, because I hadn't been there for, like, many years, when I came back and I saw how the, the demographics had changed, it was, it was just a bit very, it was just a bit uncomfortable for me to see that. Because I, um, I, you know, it was like going to a different world altogether, and um, I also yeah. noticed that, yeah, um, a lot of things had suddenly become a lot more expensive. Everything looked a lot more grubby. The uh, also being in Costa Rica and being in the Philippines, I'm no longer constantly hearing messages everywhere saying, if you see something that doesn't look right, text the British Transport Police on blah 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 <laughs> number, and. Uh, I no longer feel, I mean, you know, I can go to a bar here and smoke at the bar, for instance, um, no problem at all. Um, every time I go around anywhere, if I go into the town or the cities, yeah, the, the Philippines has a lot more armed guards, but they're not a problem. They, they smile at you. This is the thing, you know, um, <laughs> so you don't feel you're threatened. You don't feel like you're looking at someone who's trying to, you know, just as a mean, officious look on their face all the time. I don't mind that that's kind of the way it is here because this is, this is a different ball game altogether. But um, you, you see a lot of people um, riding motorbikes without helmets and uh, the, the law seems to be difficult to enforce right here when it comes to stuff like that. And um, mm. 
I'm just thinking to myself, well, where is the really true free countries? So I've decided that there's these things called hard freedoms and soft freedoms. Like the hard freedoms mm. are the, the narrative of the West, you know, the, the thing about political individualism, democracy and all of that. But they just seem really abstract to me now. They don't, they don't seem like they work in real life. Where here, in a lot of ways, it is more sort of, I suppose, authoritarian in certain ways. But I feel a lot freer here. I felt a lot freer in Costa Rica. I felt a lot freer in El Salvador. Um, even Nicaragua, which is, is definitely an authoritarian regime, I felt, you know, freer. I definitely felt freer in Colombia as well. I think it, literally everywhere I've been, apart from the UK, I don't feel like... Um, uh, the UK seems to be by far the most authoritarian place that I've been in a very long time. Now, they want to get into your mind and they want to change you. There, there's this uh, sinister technocratic thing of treating everyone as an enemy, everyone as um, mm. there's something wrong with you. You need us, the technocrats, to come along and nudge you and tweak you and fix you like uh, <laughs> you're a broken machine, you know. And I find it just really infuriating and insulting. I just think that, um, you know, who the hell mm. do you bastards think you are that you can, <laughs> the audacity to talk to me like that and mm. say, I don't need you. To, and it's like, you know, and I just, <laughs> I just feel like... Um, I mean, I, I'm not condoning the idea of this, but the way things are going in the future in the UK, I fear that violent revolution might come at some point because um, people are just going to be so sick of the way the, the, you know, the, the technocrats, the overlords there are treating everyone. And how long can this illusion of the narrative of freedom even last there any longer? And I see videos now where I was watching a video by, what's that man? Bald and Bankrupt. I don't know if you saw the video he did. Um, no, I haven't heard of that guy, no. Oh, yeah. He's, uh, his channel's called Bald and Bankrupt. He's been all around the world. <laughs> Good name. Yeah. He came back to the UK <laughs> and he went to um, places that look like they've just rotted away. Places that are really poor and full of rubbish everywhere and uh, dilapidation and houses that are empty and derelicts and stuff. And uh, mm. He showed you like a lot of places and, um, you know, uh, and yet, you know, we're supposed to be the free world. We're supposed to be in the top 10 GDP. Mm. I ain't buying this anymore. And, um, you know, I just wonder how long can they keep people under this spell for? It's It can't go on for much I, longer than I, this. I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm, I, I just think... Um, like a lot of people pointed out during COVID, in Britain, yeah. the authoritarianism is very insidious. Yeah. Uh, because it isn't so much, well, unless you go to London train stations, it's not so much, you know, uh, the police with, with uh, rifles, but it's, as we know, it's, uh, it's more of a kind of intellectual, cerebral authoritarianism in terms yeah. of what you can and can't say. And it's, a, it's more of a kind of sort of cultural authoritarianism. Yeah. Um, I just want to, um, if it's okay, I'm not sure if we can talk like this. I hope you, I hope it doesn't, your channel doesn't get banned. But in terms of, as you know, I's like a Croydon boy in it. So yeah. Um, yeah. in terms of how the demographics have changed. Um, mm. So I left Croydon back in 2002 mm. and moved to south of the UK, Hampshire. So when I was growing up in Croydon in the 80s and in the 90s, and it was quite a nice place to live, okay? Mm. And yes, you had white flight from the north, from Norbury, Streatham, Fulton Heath, mm. um, those with the means, like my parents, mm. um, they moved to the southern end of the borough, right? Where, yeah. where it was nicer, it was leafier and more predominantly white. Now, my parents didn't move because it was predominantly white they moved because it was just nicer it was quieter mm. but i recently went back to attend a funeral in streatham mm. so sort of uh, lambeth way south london so we drove on the a23 i think which is the main road that goes through the borough of croydon yeah and you go from Causton to purley to south croydon and you go all the way through yeah. and yes the demographic um had yeah, it was literally, can I say this on your channel? Spot the white person. Whereas when I left 20, when I left 20 years ago, right? No, 22, I left in 2002, 22 years ago, it was predominantly white. You would have had um, 
black and Asians, but those would have been second, third generation, okay, mm. kind of people that I would have gone to school with. Yeah. Whereas now what I pick up, pick up on is this sense in which, you know, lots of foreigners, can I say that? Can I say, well, I, you know, I think, yeah. am I entitled to say that? But also, lastly, I'm going on here, forgive me. Mm. Lastly, what I do notice what this bull chap is picking up on <laughs> with the rubbish is... Yes, the de decline in standards in terms, even just down to things like street furniture, road signs, and it there has been uh, definitely post COVID. There is this, there's this like this general malaise, and 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 I see it in people as well. I don't mean to be like um, disparaging, but there does feel like a brokenness, and as if people's. Yeah. Um, they no longer care. So in terms of your point around the revolution, I don't think people care enough. I think, I think, uh, I think they will do, to be honest. In the end, they will, oh, they will do. Well, they will do if their their bellies are empty. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, um, what to say, I know that in the UK now, they've got this stupid online safety bill, which is, um, how to say, the most Orwellian yeah. new speak, double speak, double think language you could ever say, the online tyranny bill. So um, <laughs> if there's any members of Ofcom watching this, I'm going to provide balance here, right? <laughs> so uh, to what you yeah. said, right? And the balance I say is that when I'm um, actually an ethnic minority in the UK, I'm I'm a 100% pure percent Irishman, so I am, right? <laughs> and um, I'm uh, my parents came over to England, and during the time that they came over, um, it was around about it was shortly after the Windrush generation, so. Um, I consider myself to be part of the no Irish, no blacks, no dogs tribe as a, as you know, I can have this joke with Jamaicans and they don't mind. It's never a problem. So I kind of think that, you know, I have a bit of a rapport with Jamaicans. I just tell them I'm from an Irish background and they're usually OK with me. I lived in South London amongst the black community there. And um, I kind of think that what I would call the uh, the ethnic OGs, if you like, the the first peoples um, to come over, who were the Irish blacks and the first generation of Indians who came over to the UK in the 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, mm. There was a kind of a good balance there. Although there was racism, it was mostly, most of the racism was like the skinheads and the kind of the real proper Alf Garnet types. And, um, you know, <laughs> that never really caught on because most people didn't like them. We knew that they were the far right and we knew that they we knew were... knew they were wrong. idiots. Yeah. And, yeah. um, you know, we knew, we've always had this thing in the, in the UK where we know not to go too far to the right. And it was just a no-brainer, you know. Um, we used to, like, the, the skinheads were dangerous fuckers. And, um, but what's different um, now to, you know, back in those days was the, is the fact that, um, well, since Tony Blair came in, we've gone from having um, a, a, a trickle of maybe 30,000 uh, people uh, who came from ex-British colonies who had an understanding, even though they were very culturally alien, they had um, a, a basic understanding of how kind of like the traditions work. They grew up in, you know, places that were part of the old British Empire. They had enough in mm. common with us that it didn't upset the balance and Britain could assimilate them. I mean, a lot of the young, like, black people of Jamaican origin are very, very assimilated. They're probably the most assimilated people apart from the Irish and have been all my life. I've known them all my life right back to the, when I was a kid in the 1970s. There were a few arseholes, but that, there's always a few arseholes in all demographics. But my, my issue here is that since um, the Tony Blair years, they've opened up the door to God knows who from God knows where in gargantuan numbers. And mm. the NGOs collude with the indirectly with the people smuggling gangs they they tell people to lose their passports they give them advice on how to pretend to be from countries that they're not lie about their age lie about the nationality and all of that they they even coach them into answering the questions that will get asked by the border force or by the home office when they arrive in the uk and um we don't know where they're from and you know like i say there's so many countries, isn't it? Syria, Somalia, Eritrea, you know, like Albania. I mean, we don't have any connection to the British Empire, no. to any of these people. We don't know who they are. The ones that are arriving seem to be predominantly men in their 20s uh, or 30s, mm. and um, there don't seem to be that many women. Now, there are legal immigrants coming into the UK. Uh, it's probably not the same for that. But, um, you know, um, as, as time goes on, there's an obvious time bomb building up. And, um, 
you know, I, I had this conversation with the Mrs. Angela. She's here in the Philippines, and she told me that uh, she found out about a bunch of Afghans that were going to be moved to uh, to the Philippines, that they were thinking of moving to like ten or 11,000 Afghans to the Philippines. And she was not happy with that at all. And um, But, you know, there are, the woke can't get away with calling her racist because she's brown-skinned herself, right? So... Um, mm. So you go outside the non-white world, you ask the Filipinos, do you want uh, loads of Afghan men to come over here? And they'll not be very comfortable with it. I think a whole family are not comfortable with the idea of that. Um, but because we're white, we're supposed to have this white guilt. We're supposed to feel ashamed of empires and stuff like that. It doesn't work on the Irish. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. The Irish have got nothing to feel guilty about as we were subjugated by the British Empire for so long and became really poor and had a famine and, were, you know, loads of people were wiped out and it was all the fault of the British Empire that, that happened. Now I, I could use that as an excuse to go woke and go angry and um, maybe in the past I would have done that more, but... But then, you know, the, the, the problem is not that anymore. The problem is we don't know who's coming into the UK or into Europe in general. And, um, you, you know, when you think about statistics of knife, knife crime going up, rubbish everywhere, um, vandalism, just the whole aesthetic and the appearance of areas now becoming more and more derelict. Um, people being less scared to go out now, people becoming more fragmented. As well as that, the internet, by its very nature, atomizing people even more. Everyone has retreated into their own little echo chambers, and it's exacerbated the problem. There's so many things involved in making this problem bad. So, you know, I'm going to say that when, um, for, for Mr. Ofcom who's watching this, when Ant said about spot the yeah. white person, right, the context of what we mean is that I left West Drayton and Uxbridge, I came back, and I was walking around the place and I noticed that only 10% of the people were white. Whereas, um, you know, when I lived there, it was like 80%. All my life, there's been ethnic minorities um, up until the point where rapid replacement seemed to be happening. I never had a problem with it. And um, I can think of myself as being a non-racist going all the way back to the 1980s. I hated the skinhead. I hated the far right. Um, but at the same time, I've noticed that recently the far left have become more of a problem as we don't have the skinheads we used to have, but now we've got the woke, now we've got like religious zealots, and now we've got, um, we, we seem to have a kind of a propaganda matrix telling us that we're wrong for believing what they don't want us to believe and accusing us of heresies and prejudices that we don't actually really have. And, uh, and we never used to tread, feel like we were treading on eggshells when we were having these conversations back in the day. And, uh, yeah, so, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I'd say to Mr. Ofcom. <laughs> so, yeah. Can I, I, I'm going to try and further atone now, Niall, by saying, and people go, this is, this is classic what racists say. Well, as you know, I've got a foreign surname, Italian surname. So mm. my grandfather, mm. uh, Pop, he, he came to um, the UK in the 1920s from northern Italy. Mm just outside Milan yeah. in that sort of post um, kind of depression uh, period. And, he put in, and like a lot of immigrants of that time, Italian immigrants, um, he, he went upon arrival, he worked in the restaurant industry oh, yeah. and he probably would have worked as he traveled across Europe and then eventually landed up in the UK. Um, I do agree just back to the point we were talking about a little bit earlier. I do think there is this, there's this toxic mix now, and I, and I know a lot of kind of um, people in the alternative media, if you want to call them truthers, whatever, yeah. go by that moniker, believe that it's all planned. Okay, I think, yeah, I can understand that, like, um, mm. you know, the, um, the Trojan horse, the enemy within, and all the rest of it. But yeah. the problem is, I think things are now so fractured within mm. society and you probably picked up when you were briefly back in the UK, although in Devon it's it's not it's it's slightly softer, of course. But there's such a sense of brokenness. More yeah. and more people are, are feeling that and sensing that. But like you say, the political establishment, the media are still, you know, banging on about cultural enrichment and going on and on about you know racism. These people are racism that, and there's there is this disconnect between what you know people are being told even through, you know, through the mainstream media and what they're feeling and sensing at work and all the ridiculous you know diversity and you know anti-slavery policies so i do think there is something that's going to give and what is interesting um 
like reform uh, the political party reform they're not really ma- making much traction I-, I was surprised that they didn't create a lot like, an anti-lockdown party so i feel as if the system isn't going to try and offset this kind of implosion if you like so it's almost as if you know i think like thomas sheridan spoke spoken about this quite a lot in terms of the wave function collapse it's almost like um they can't it's almost like they've given up in a way, you know, whereas in the past they would have, we would have seen maybe, I don't know, new, new labor, you know, cause mm. we had new labor. Oh, yeah. We would have seen new, it's almost like they've just given up now. Mm. And in some regards, that's quite scary because where it's going to go. And just lastly on this point, I just want to say, I totally agree with you in terms of like all of this race baiting going on, mm. because when I grew up like you with similar age in the seventies and eighties. And when I was at school, um, you know, you didn't even, like, and they were, um, you know, uh, black children, uh, Asian children. We had the Polish as well, but you didn't even think in terms of race or the colour. You just, t- you know, someone, if someone was a twat, they were a twat, you know, <laughs> yeah. someone was, you know, bullying you, just punch them back. The, the colour of their skin was I- irrelevant. And mm. it just, um, because a lot of these things um, largely are, but I do agree with the point you make about the more disturbing element um is sort of after Blair was brought in, which I think, again, this is conspiratorial, but I think he was brought in to complete the project, you know, destroy Britain, if you like. I definitely mm-hmm. think he he was brought in. And just to make a cultural reference um, in terms of this issue of race, it, it just puts to mind, um, um, I was a big fan, I, was, uh, I don't know when to uh, uh, Urban Beats there, but um, I'm a big fan of the comedy Peep Show. And there was um, one episode... Um, um and there's this posh character whose name escapes me and she was going out with uh, a black character yeah. and um she said at one stage oh i didn't even know he was black and it's quite <laughs> funny because it kind of speaks to this idea where we're obsessed now uh with race and it's like you know because we're, we're in this divide and rule kind of thing and and it is all it is just reaching like you were saying an absurdist level now and mm. i perhaps maybe before the end of today's show we could talk a little bit you know like uh, you which drove you to leave the uk because it is in many ways woke or orthodoxy is making life intolerable now i think in the uk in many regards yeah well this i mean one of the things that does bother me about the uk is that i think that um well i think that our leaders hate us um that's one thing i think they treat us like we're if they could get away with just genociding us all and killing us all, they would do, right? Uh, I think yeah. that they hate us. I think they look down upon us. Um, I think they think they're better than us in every way. I think they are some of the most hubris-filled scumbags you could ever wish to imagine. Um, you know, mm. and um, and uh, you know they, the, everything about them is false. The way they present themselves is completely false. It's insulting. Uh, I just feel held in contempt by the very existence of any of them. You know, I look at the, uh, I mean, I look at what's going on. I mean, recently, what I noticed is that I think it was it eighty-seven percent of people turned out to vote for Vladimir Putin, and yet um, Britain, a country where they ousted the democratically elected leader, replaced them mm. with the people who joined the Conservative Party who voted for Liz Truss. And then when she won the Democratic vote from the party members, they then kicked her out and then Rishi Sunak just sashayed his way in. So Britain <laughs> is in no position whatsoever to call Vladimir Putin a dictator who won the election again on an 87% turnout. And I mean, God, most Britons are not stupid enough to do that in the UK um, to turn out for that this level of numbers. Again, you know, if you go to El Salvador, Nayib Bukele, he won on, um, you know, again, another huge majority. Um, he, The country was under siege by the, was it MS-13, I think they called, who were gangs who, you know, in order to join the gang, you have to murder someone. Uh, the country was just um, a complete nightmare. He come along built these super prisons, locked them all up, got them out of the way, smashed up all the anything and everything to do with uh, even even the gravestones. He, he removed all the symbols. He just completely eradicated everything. He made the MS-13 logos illegal in the country. It came down on them like a ton of bricks. And, um, and then he's turned El Salvador into one of the most prosperous as well as um, one of the safest countries in the whole of... Um, 
of uh, the of North and South and Central America. Um, mm. He's not, you know, like I say, but the problem is that the lefty, you know, the, the human rights lawyers are complaining, well, what about the human rights of all the gangsters? And it's like, well, you know, you, the kids don't have to worry about, little girls no longer have to worry about being stolen from um, from their parents and, and, and raped and no longer have to worry about their fathers being murdered trying to protect them anymore. That problem has gone. And, um, you know, the, the murder rate in El Salvador, which was one of the highest in the world, just went overnight pretty much well not overnight but you know as good as and um you know when he goes online he is twitter on, on x or twitter he um he jokes a lot you know so um he uh makes jokes about himself ironically being a dictator but he's just having a laugh when he does it <laughs> and um you know he he wears a back to front baseball cap a lot of the time although he does dress in his formal attire he never wears a tie and um, when he has, you know, when, when the BBC or CNN or AM ask, you know, he, he's very brutally outspoken and says, well, what makes you lot think you're in a position to lecture us? I mean, look at the state of your countries, you know, look what we've achieved. You can't tell us we're wrong. You sort your own shit out first. And he's, uh, you know, so I'm looking at these people again, Javier Millet turns up at the World Economic Forum, tells them that their ideas are really shit and really bad for the world. And then, and then, but it arrives, and you know, he doesn't get a private plane. He arrives there on a passenger jet, you know, sits with the peasants, and um, so we're having this kind of uprising, this populist uprising. And again, um, you know, I, I don't know why we're involved in the whole Ukraine and Russia thing. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, Vladimir Putin might be a wrong one in certain ways, but you know. He basically got in, told the oligarchs, right, you don't have any power, I'm the big cheese here. The oligarchs are now below him. Britain's an oligarchy with weak puppet leaders. And we we don't really know how our oligarchs are. They're they're very um you know, they're very genteel oligarchs, but I mean the whole of Europe does seem to be run by puppets now and we don't know who's above them and uh you know, I just yeah, I was just looking at this whole thing and thinking, Yeah, we we're in a, a complete mess now and what the hell? You know, and and everyone knows it. Anyone with a with an IQ over a IQ over a glass of water can see it. And um, they're not they're not fooling anyone, not really. You know, but they're, they're so yeah, I, yeah. So yeah, I, I agree. It's the sorry, yeah. Um, the way in which you know Western me, media outlets like the BBC still try and old hu- uphold sorry this ridiculous idea of western liberal democracy having some sort of moral uh, some sort of i don't know you know can't find the words or it's some sort of what's the word um that we in the west you know we've got all these um sort of uh protocols in place we've got these institutions that ensure freedom and and democracy and what what do they call it um oh the international community oh which yeah is just a, which just, just just um basically normally involves um coercion like with the first gulf war when america wanted its allies and inverted commas to join it normally they're just involved in coercing countries to join them to join them so that's the mm-hmm. international you know the international community so this idea of civility this idea of progressiveness is being exposed more and more and it's only those who have a financial vested interest Mm. in keeping it going the bureaucrats the politicians the ngos whereas all of us outside of that can see it's ridiculous and just as an example recently i heard an interview on bbc radio 4 and they were speaking to um a russian journalist and obviously the researcher hadn't have done their work didn't hadn't done their work properly because they were a Putin symp- symp- sympathizer. Oh. So the guy um, was interviewing her and she was saying quite clearly of, you know, uh, highly suspicious links to Ukraine, this attack in Moscow. And it got to the stage where obviously she was off message so much that the BBC interview, he just cut her off. Yeah. So he didn't even he didn't even go like, oh, sorry, the the line's getting a bit, you know, broken up here. Sorry, thank you, thank you. He just mm. cut her off. Oh. I think he actually said, oh, I'm not listening to this anymore, and cut her off. God, yeah. That's I mean, bad. that just shows you, doesn't it? Yeah, the impartial BBC, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I say that uh, 
we got to get on to the uh, cake conspiracy thing before before we oh, go. Oh, the cake! Yeah. You can't avoid the cake before we depart, can we? Yeah. Yeah, I just um, I just want to say I've enjoyed your coverage. Not blowing smoke up your arse. That's all right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, because um, mm. I think we do need a nuanced approach at this time. Yeah, uh, and I, I think I, I have to put my hand up. Actually, and admit I was, um, I was uh, losing myself a bit and thinking, oh, is she dead? Is she not? Yeah. Has a you know slap head? Is he? Is he knocked her about? Has she gone out a well with the kids? And mm. so yeah, your last video that you did about drawing a line. Mm. Um, I'm sure I wasn't alone in appreciating that. In the the importance of just detaching and going do you know what we're never actually going to know what's happened yeah now let's just get on with life things that we can deal with and things that actually are important and i don't mean that in a disrespectful way in terms of her illness but i just mean there comes a point where you go right draw the line carry on yeah i mean you know i don't want to live vicariously through the royals and i don't really want the powers that be to be living like sitting tenants inside my head which is i mean Mm. another thing as well but yeah i mean like i said i mean i'm the the people have probably seen the last two videos. The reason why I'd done that forensic analysis was because I thought, well, you know, if you resort to good old fashioned Baconian scientific method with repeatability and stuff like that, um, you can see certain things. And there were certain anomalies. I mean, yeah, I looked at that picture of the Vogue magazine <clears throat> and I mm. come to the conclusion that, it, you know, if you took distance, perspective, time, angles, and the ability to be able to pull exactly the same facial expression, all of those different factors, it did create Mm. a God knows how many hundreds of thousands to one chance of you being able to line up your face to look exactly the same in two photos. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm 100% conclusive, but it does look to me a bit suspicious when I see that. The, and um, mm. the, the the badly photoshopped pictures. The, the what I did with the um, you know with the Kate image where I got the AI enhanced version and I blended it with the old one, and um, and it did actually look more like Kate when I did it than than the than the gen. Because as I said, I'd I'd use this same software to try to get a blurry image of my mum. The face that came out looked nothing like my mum. It, it, it just creates generic mm. identity images from archives. Mm. That's all it does. And so you can't mm. take any of that on face value. And um, so when I put all the pictures together, it did clearly, I did see a lot of discrepancies. And I thought, well, if I was on a jury, that's what you do on a jury, you know? Mm. Um, but so we're allowed to do that when we're on a jury, but we're not allowed to do that when we're trying to investigate what's actually going on. So, so in that case, um, maybe we should just say, oh, I don't want to do jury service anymore because um, my forensic examination last time I done it um, got me cancelled <laughs> or whatever. So I don't want to, you know, um, I might have the wrong opinions for this and I might be too guilty of wrong think, even if I'm thoroughly, you know, looking out. But then when um, Kate came out um, and we saw that video of her, um, mm. Then I saw these people starting saying that this was fake, and there was all sorts of things on there. I mean, I want to point out a lot of things. Firstly, you remember that video where I'd done a split screen and I'd done the Dimension Jump to England one? Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you were to go watch that video again, one of the things you'll notice is that nothing in the background moves at all. It was low pressure, there was no wind, and uh, the weather was identical to the weather on that Kate video. So, you know, I could say that that was a green screen and that was a deep fake. Um, so, but that's what happened. Uh, again, you know, people were talking about um, saying that that combined with the blurry image in the background. Well, if they're using a big camera with a big lens, you get bokeh blur. That's normal. People were then saying that, oh, that's um, that's uh, what was it? A a jumper that she wore seven years ago. Well, she might have, <clears throat> you know, she might have that favourite jumper that she doesn't get out very often. But it looked like it was a bit figure hugging on her seven years ago, and it looked baggy today. Um, they were saying, well, that doesn't look like her face. Her jawline looks different. Again, if she's mm. got cancer and she's getting treatment, then she's going to become more gaunt. I mean, that's natural. That will happen. And then they say, oh, what happened to her mole? Well, maybe she had it removed. It's not unusual for famous people to get moles removed. And she probably didn't want to tell mm. anyone. But it's not unusual for all celebrities these days to go get a little bit done here and there. Um, there was that apparent anomaly, the reflection of her stripy jumper on the um, corner of the bench. Um, you know, I've used, I'm sure you've used polyurethane varnish. I, I know when I see it. It was completely consistent with all of the reflective surfaces that I saw on there. And the line of her shadow was completely consistent with the sunlight in England at spring equinox as well. 
knowing as I run on the reasons why I can't become a flat earther, I pay attention to the (laughs) angle of the sun. Right here at the moment, the sun at midday is almost directly above our head, and then the second or third week of April it goes on to the north side until, until, uh, you know, summer solstice then it goes back in the middle of august it goes back directly above winter solstice it goes that side so um you know that that angle of sunlight at 40 degree of latitude uh, no nine degrees of latitude where i am where you are at 50 51 degrees of latitude that's the angle of the sun so so i pay attention Mm -hmm. to all of those details that most people don't notice and um and then the, there was a thing about them saying that the about the disappearing ring on her finger. Well, I looked at people who were zooming into that, and when you, it looks quite pixelated when you zoom in, and that's just normal MP4 digital artifacts as far as I could see. I could see no discrepancies. Uh, there was a, a AI generator. Now I pointed this out um, on my last video that it said it was 97% likely to be AI generated. So I got a photo from a previous video, and I found out that I'm 84% likely to be AI generated. <laughs> but, but I used f- uh, film grain and saturation to make my, because um, just like I use analog modeled plugins, which I'm going to be using on both of our voices in this, because I like my, I'm old fashioned, and I like my picture, my sound, to have more a celluloid tape feel to it, because I just don't like the cold clinical digital um, presentation. Analog, yeah. Yeah, I like to make everything more analog than, than it, because that's just my taste. Now, that will then make me appear to be more AI generated as a result of that, because, um, you know, mm. also technology is in its infancy at this point, so it's not really that good. Go ask in 20 years' time, it will give you a better result. I mean, AI at the moment is mm. like the. BBC Micro or the Vic 20 stage, isn't it? Or like the internet in the <laughs> 1990s right now. It's, it's got a long way to go and we forget that. And um, so there's all these people who are saying all this stuff. And, um, and I just think that, well, I don't see any evidence. And one thing that no one is saying is, if they're so crap at Photoshop, what makes you think that they're going to be so good at AI that I can't spot any of it? And it's just, mm. you know... Uh, so I've come to the conclusion now that um, Edward Dutton's bit, I don't know if you've come across Edward Dutton, the jolly heretic. Yeah, yeah. He's talking about yeah. the average IQ going down as a real idiocracy effect, and it's affecting pretty much everyone. So since um, uh, it's become a lot easier for people to get into university, the IQ of university students has gone down by 20 or 30 points. Um, mm. And now we're dealing with midwit elites, and I mean, I know that my IQ is above <laughs> average, but I also know that I'm now becoming smarter than the elite, so I can't, I mean, I might sound arrogant when I say I don't care if people let them think that, but I'm now looking at the elites and I'm thinking they're stupider than I am, you know? Mm. And there's a lot of really good maverick YouTubers out there who I think are more intelligent than me, but the political classes and the elites and the, the people who are trying to be the gatekeepers, they just seem really, really stupid to me now. And uh, I don't know how a successful um, grand conspiracy can work while the average IQ of the elites is falling at <laughs> such a pace. So I think there may be some... I thought they were omnipotent. <laughs> oh, yeah, omnipotent gods, aren't they? Yeah, that's the thing. Uh, shape-shifting <laughs> lizards. Uh, yeah, I don't buy this. Uh, I just think that the... If we're upscaling them to infinity like this, we're disempowering ourselves, which then makes me think, Mm. is the alternative media and is the conspiracy sphere part of the propaganda matrix? Are they doing more to demoralise us and fill us with fear? Mm. Is the black pill thing a Trojan horse? Is it is it a a, a, a conspiracy of a second order, if you if you like? Mm. Um, and yeah. are they even aware that that's what they're doing and so I'm questioning yeah. everything I, I'm, I'm the ultimate I, I heretic now so <laughs> the ultimate yeah I call myself uh, the the truth for heretic um I yeah. just if, if I've got time to just quickly add on yeah. interesting points you're making firstly from someone who did get lost in the what I call the truth for trap or the black pill delusion was yeah once you once you once you get your emotions involved like you've done it forensically your emotions are detached you don't care either way the information you find from your forensic approach mm. whereas when i was lost in the truth of trap or the black pill delusion it was all about my emotions and my hatred for the world and my hatred for the people doing it which was for me at the time like a lot of truthers in inverted commas zionism and the whole jewish control thing and all the rest of it yeah. and then then basically because i think we are in this sort of energetic war mm. that it we we have to kind of 
keep our emotions um, in check. And and I know that can be hard when we're looking at really evil acts that have, uh, and, and things that continue in the way in which humanity is manipulated. But otherwise, we are giving our power away. And just lastly, um, what I thought was really interesting was how all of the stuff about Kate mm. essentially came from the mainstream, didn't it, right? Mm. So like you said, Royal Enders, uh, right? So, you know, it's a soap opera, yeah. right? And yet when I went onto my Facebook, I did have a bit of fun. You know, I was looking at your posts, sharing with other people, you know, and um, it was, I was, it was, it was interesting, right? Because it was, I, I did see it as like a soap opera. I wasn't like, I need to prove to people that they're fooling us. Mm. I have tried, I, I have had that impulse in the past. And then you can, then it's just a bit of fun. And then you log off and you go and make your dinner or you go and do whatever you're doing. But I think when you're in this sort of black pill delusion, which we'll probably talk about more in future um, episodes or shows or whatever, is is that emotional need to prove to the world that mm. how you view something, it's true. But a lot of these things, we never can. We, we mm. never can know the truth. Like we'll never know the ultimate truth of 9-11 mm. uh, and many other events. I've just, because that was one of my rabbit holes that I uh, went down. And just, yeah, I do agree that, the fact that we've got something that was so much in the mainstream, the alternative media ran with it. You think, well, where was their discern- Where was that discernment? Where mm. was you know? It was a lot of useful idiots in the alternative uh, mm. media who were running with this. Yeah. And it's like you know, it just brings us back to the importance of being detached, if you like. Yeah, I think um, you know we've got to be because uh, it, it's just become really silly. Like, you know, I just feel like, uh, you know, I feel like I'm the only grown-up half the time now. And, uh, you know... <laughs> You're the only grown-up in the room now. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it's like, you know, I've, n- I've never really considered myself to be a grown-up, you know. It's like if someone calls me Mr. Murphy, I say, no, don't call me that. Make me sound like my dad. So I don't consider myself to be that <laughs> the classic grown-up and like, like people were in the old days. But somehow, like, um, I just does feel like I'm dealing with fucking toddlers, you know, these days, you know, who, and especially like... Uh, in the media, uh, you know, as well as as well as the so-called truth movement, there isn't really anywhere to go anymore. And if you are, like I say, yeah. if you are into looking at things in a more nuanced way, unless you know, there are a few channels. I mean, there's a few channels that I do watch. I'm into. Um, I do like to watch uh, Lotus Eaters. I don't fully agree with everything that they are, but um, I do like to watch. You know, you know, Lotus Eaters. Carl Benjamin. Um, was it Ka- yeah, Callum yes. Josh? All that lot, right? Because um, they're they're a mixed bunch of people, but uh, I like to watch them because they do seem very sensible. They do present everything in a really sensible way. They also have some banter and they have a laugh, but they do seem like um, if I met them, I'd quite happily bang the world to rights with them in a pub. If I ever go to Swindon again, I meet them. I would, you know, because they seem mm. like all right, and um, you know they're they're quite unpretentious and um they're they're, they're quite sober-minded and there's very few people like that i also like um mark stein i still i still follow him on his on his website and um mm. you know but there's but there's very few people i mean some a lot of people i just think have jumped the shark now i can't stand ben shapiro anymore i um uh, jordan peterson douglas murray used to like douglas murray but He's become mm. very entrenched in that Israel-Palestine thing, taking aside, and uh, I can't because you know the thing that really upset me about about that Hamas invasion was that a Psytrance party got um, you know attacked. Yeah, sure. And I mm. could have met. I mean, people I've probably met before got probably got slaughtered. It didn't matter to me mm. whether they were Jews or not. What mattered to me is they were part sure. of um, an alternative community that I knew about in the past, and well, they're peace-loving. They probably they have to go to the army once a year, but they are probably reluctant about it. So, mm. you know, it, it kind of makes sense to me that the peaceniks are, and the kibbutz people as well, the peaceniks are usually the first targets when it comes to stuff like this. Um, I've been watching videos by Efrat Fenixen, and she's um, uh, based in uh, Tel Aviv. She's Israeli, she's Jewish, <clears throat> but she mm. has reservations about the Netanyahu administration. And um, we're not allowed to... Um, be critical of the Netanyahu administration that makes us anti-Semitic I mean if I look at the situation I think you know I don't want any harm to come to the, the Psytrance community but I'm suspicious about mm. Netanyahu because he's part of that whole government globalist thing um, 
And if I was going to be in the UK, I'd say, right, if there's any parties or festivals I want to go to, they might not be my ideal people to hang around with, but I wouldn't want any harm to come with them. But I see Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer in a very different way. That doesn't make me Anglo-Saxon. And, uh, you know, likewise, the retaliation and what's going on in Palestine, I'm not comfortable with what's going on there either. And, um, you know, I just Mm. think that it's an unwinnable war. It's an unsolvable conflict. Um, I don't have any Mm. skin in the game. I'm neither an Arab nor a Jew myself. Even when the troubles were here, were well, here, I'm not there. Oh, God, I've, is that a Freudian slip? Maybe it's his green screen. All those coconut trees are not real. I'm in England. Now, um, maybe when I, when, I, <laughs> when I was in England and I grew up with the troubles with the IRA and I used to have kids calling me IRA bomber and all of that um, because of my name, um, I couldn't take sides because I'd become aware, I became aware of the fact that my, my London accent would get me half the people would want to kill me in Northern Ireland for that. The other half of the people would want to kill me because I've got a very ridiculous Irish name. And um, I saw two different news outlets because I, I was in a position to juxtapose the BBC versus RTE. And I was wondering, mm. why is my uncle in Dublin's neighbours supporting the hunger strikers? But it changed my perspective. And uh, <clears throat> even with that, I couldn't take a side. So, um, and I did have a dog in that fight. Um, so... We shouldn't be involving ourselves in foreign, unwinnable wars that we don't understand. I'm not a Slav. I don't understand you, Russia, Ukraine. No, no. You know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And, uh, and also, yeah. Um, sorry to interrupt. No, carry on. Um, yeah. Uh, just quickly, obviously, because I realise we're coming up on time now, is that I think why perhaps, you know, Lotus Eaters and, and other channels like that, mm-hmm. they bridged a gap between, you know, just conspiracy and you know just being stuck in the mainstream because i think Mm. an aspect of being like what i would call an unconscious truther is that you can throw the baby out with the bathwater so it's like everything that happens in the mainstream it's all a lie i'm not even gonna because what i've always liked about your work now is that you focus on what i would call the culture wars right Mm. in a in a clever way but then you 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 kind of extrapolate that to the bigger picture of what's going on and that's what you know people like on lotus eaters they do because once you become too tribal and like i'm an ardent truther and everything in the world is a lie as i say you've kind of like you've i'm not saying you know there are always a lot of deception of course there is but then you've you've kind of just like removed yourself to this pine, tiny plot of land is where you're just standing yeah. and then you're just it's it's very hard to reconcile yourself to the world and mm. And what's going on so by extension everything becomes emotional and everything mm-hmm. becomes extreme and i only say this again not because i'm pointing the finger at unconscious truth because truth is sorry because that's where i was for quite a number of years so i know what what can happen and i'm not mm-hmm. saying it's right and wrong we're all on our own journeys i know some people can stay stuck in that space for a while uh, for, for many years and not go a bit crazy like i did so it's dependent mm-hmm. on our own psychology as well Yes, yeah. of course. Well, I think um, I, I've been through yeah. my crazy time before. Um, you know, I, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's a rite of passage. And I think you just got to come it out is. the other yeah, end. It is, yeah, it's an archetypal it. journey for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, yeah, so we should probably wrap this up then. But yeah, we have to uh, yeah. stay, on line for, uh, stay on line for a bit of uh, yes. yeah, wrapping it up off air yes. as well. So yeah, all right, well, cheers yeah. for taking the time out then. And, you know, Thank we'll you, to, Niall. It's been, do, a, it's been yeah. a blast. Yeah, it's been cool. We'll have to do this again at some yeah. point soon then. All right, yeah. cool, sure. all right. See you later. Okay, well, I hope that was up your street. Um, me and Ant have decided that we're going to um, have conversations like this, Skype chats like this, maybe once a month, maybe once every five or six weeks or something like that, and try to make this a regular recurring part of this channel. And um, I think it adds a bit of an extra dimension to it. Basically means I'm banging the world to rights with someone else and all sorts of topics come up that otherwise I wouldn't do if it was just me on my Todd. So yeah, good on Ant for taking the time out to do that. I think this is definitely um, going to be a regular thing. So, um, yeah, yeah, good on Ant for returning to this channel for the first time in a year. Um, you know, our lives have kind of gone off in different directions, I suppose, since then. But, um, yeah, stay tuned for the next one. Um, in the meantime, I'm getting ready for my next video here right now. And, um, yeah, <laughs> you shall see. In the meantime, see you later, alligator. See you soon. Baboon.
If you like this content, don't forget to like, subscribe and share. And while you're at it, check out all our social media links. Please help this channel grow. Your help will be appreciated.